again, want to thank you all for taking the time to uh, join us. Um, to give you all just a, a little bit of background on Cirrus Consulting Group, uh, we have been in business for uh, 24, 23 going on 24 years now. And as many of you may know, uh, we do specialize in helping dentists uh, with the negotiations of their office lease agreements. Um, we essentially support doctors who are going through the motions of starting new practices. Uh, we work with doctors who are existing practice owners who rent or lease their space um, and uh, are, have a lease agreement coming up for renewal or expiring within the next few years and would like to renegotiate their rental rates uh, as well as amend or revise some of the legal terms to limit liability in their lease agreements. And we also work with doctors who are nearing retirement, who uh, are thinking of transitioning or selling their practice um, you know, sometime within the next five to 10 years or sooner. Um, and we essentially ensure that the lease agreement is actually aligned with their transition plans. And as many of you may know, I know some of you may have uh, purchased your practices. Uh, some of you may be uh, going through the motions of planning to transition or sell your practice uh, in the next few years. The lease agreement is very relevant to the sale or acquisition of the practice. And we will spend some time uh, this morning discussing how and why and um, how the lease agreement really plays into that equation. Uh, however, it is important that you do keep in mind that the lease agreement is, is essential to the sale or acquisition of the practice. Um, on an annual basis, we will represent approximately 1,000 doctors uh, across the country in the negotiations of their lease agreement. Uh, the way our firm is structured, we are not a uh, real estate agency or a brokerage. Um, we're really more of a consulting slash law firm. So we have a team of real estate attorneys in-house um, all of whom specialize in uh, supporting, advising, and representing dentists. We have a dedicated leasing team in-house comprised of lease analysts who are able to uh, provide our team with intel on uh, rental rates and comparables and what is available on the market. And then we have an in-house consulting team. Um, all of our consultants have a background in business and finance and they work collaboratively with our legal and leasing team on the strategy for our clients. Uh, we do lecture extensively across the country. Uh, we do uh, perform uh, approximately 150 continuing education accredited courses, um, essentially with the sole purpose of educating and um, enlightening dentists on the relevance of the real estate component of their business. And uh, we are generally invited to be guest speakers at many of the large national conferences, so every few years, uh, we will speak at the Greater New York Dental Meeting, the uh, California uh, Dental Association's annual meetings, the uh, Pacific Dental Conference, the Yankee, the Hinman. So we, we do lecture extensively, um, really with the hope of, of educating dentists um, about the real estate component of their practice. Now, the purpose of the webinar this morning is to talk about, um, first of all, just a high level of why the lease agreement is relevant to you. We will spend some time discussing some of the key terms and conditions in your lease and what the broader legal implications are. And we will also spend some time talking about some practical advice on how to negotiate or renegotiate the terms of your lease agreement. Now, I do like to start off by just talking just kind of generally about what a lease agreement is. Now, I know from experience many of you likely know what a lease is. You know, in, in, in a nutshell, it's an agreement between you as the tenant and the landlord or lessor outlining the terms and conditions of your tenancy. Um, the reason that you see a check before you is because for most dentists, rent is one of your bigger overhead expenses. Generally, number one expense will be staff wages, secondly will be lab expenses, and third will be your rent or occupancy expenses. Um, generally, rent and occupancy expenses or lab expenses are interchangeable. Sometimes rent is your second biggest overhead, um, and lab is third and vice versa. But it is relevant. It's obviously one of the bigger overhead costs, and I know for many practices, it's you know a sensitive topic. In fact, most of you from experience will be paying somewhere between seven to ten percent of every dollar you collect towards your rent or occupancy expenses. Now, the interesting thing is, when you, if you think about it, many of you will actually practice dentistry for you know at least in private practice, probably on average of about, of about 25 to 30 years. And most of you, on average, will rent between, or, or the average, let's just say, dentist will rent between 
call it 1,500 to 2,000 square feet for their office. Um, generally, you'll have four treatment rooms or four operatories. Um, and most of you will practice for about 25 or 30 years. You'll also pay, on average, somewhere in the range of about anywhere from on the, the low side of the spectrum, about $3,000 a month in rent. Um, and some of you are paying upwards of $10,000 plus per month in rent. Most of you, on average, will be in the five or $6,000 per range um, in terms of your monthly expenses to the building. Now, if you think about it, if you amortize that cost over the number of years that you practice for, let's just say 30 years, and let's assume that you're paying $5,000 a month in rent over that entire 30-year period of time, which obviously, as many of us know, is unlikely because for most of you, your rental rates will increase every year. But assuming that your rent does not increase and you pay $5,000 per month for 30 years, if you calculate that, you're actually paying $1.8 million in rent over that period of time. The reason we put up a check is because unbeknownst to most dentists, when you sign a lease or when you signed your lease, it is actually one of the most expensive checks you will ever write in your entire life. My goal over the next 20 or so minutes, you know, which is a very short and abbreviated period of time, is to enlighten you that when it comes to negotiating lease agreements, it's not only about negotiating rent. A lot of doctors assume, in fact, a lot of tenants assume, when you're negotiating a lease agreement, the only thing you negotiate is rent and term. How much do you pay per month and how many years or months are you committing to? That is only one part of the negotiations. You also need to understand that the contract you're signing or have signed has very broad implications on your ability to sell the business. And if it's not structured properly, it will be a very costly problem for you down the road. That is part of what we are going to discuss over the next 15 to 20 or so minutes. Now, why is the lease agreement important to you? Well, first of all, as many of you do know, it is awfully expensive to build a dental practice. Most of you, on average, will invest upwards of $150 to $200 per square foot to simply build your office, which means for most of you, investment-wise, you're looking at a quarter of a million to a half a million dollar plus investment before you're even operational and before you're generating any revenue. Now, what that also means is your lease agreement should provide you with long-term stability and security. Your lease agreement should enable you to practice in your location for, for many of you, the entirety of your career, whether that would be 10, 15, 20, or 30 plus years, or sometimes 40 plus years. Your lease agreement should also minimize any risk or exposures that you may have. Generally speaking, in a lot of commercial lease agreements, the building will require that you provide a personal guarantee. And essentially what a personal guarantee stipulates is that if there's a dispute between you and the building owner, they have the ability to pursue legal actions against you personally, and they can go after your family and your estate and the assets of your family and your estate. So from a liability standpoint, not ideal, which is why, generally speaking, we do recommend to most doctors that they incorporate their businesses. Whether you incorporate under a PLLC or a professional corporation and you know, there's a variety of different ways to incorporate your business, but we do generally recommend that you incorporate your business not for tax purposes, but really to shelter assets and liabilities of your business, essentially to shelter liabilities from you personally. That being said, many of you will encounter cases, and I'm sure many of you have, where the landlord will be adamant that you provide a guarantee. It's important that you understand in commercial real estate, number one, everything is negotiable. That's number one. Number two, there are always middle grounds. So if a landlord, for example, is adamant you provide a personal guarantee, and we deal with literally hundreds of cases like this a year, what we will generally do is we will negotiate limitations on the guarantee, whether that would be an expiry date, a max dollar value that the guarantee exposes you to. Um, generally, there are you know, a number of different ways for us to limit that guarantee to provide further protection to you, your family, and your estate. You also want to make sure your lease agreement maximizes flexibility. Many of you will have associates practicing for you in your practice. The lease agreement generally should stipulate that you have the right to engage associate dentists as independent contractors to join your business, 
without going through any necessary approval process with your building owners. Many of you may have associates currently practicing for you without even advising your building owners that they are an occupant of the building. Now, the only reason that landlords even need to be advised that you're having an associate practice for you is because they're not really an employee of the business because of how they're compensated, at least in some cases. Um, however, they are an occupant of the building. And as such, there are broader insurance implications. So as it relates to maximizing flexibility, there are a variety of ways to do so. But we, it is important that the lease protect you and maximize your flexibility as a business owner. Your lease agreement also needs to be stipulated to enable you to sell the business at any point in time without the building owner or property manager materially interfering with that process. There should also be conditions in your lease agreement so that, God forbid, something happens to you. God forbid you get sick, you pass away, you're incapacitated and can no longer practice dentistry. There should be a stipulation that enables your family and your estate to terminate the lease. God forbid any of those occur. Essentially, it, we, we refer to it as a death and disability clause. It's really designed to protect your family and your estate. God forbid something happens to you. And lastly, your lease agreement should also provide you with fair and affordable financial terms. In a lot of cases, many of you I know from experience probably feel as if you're paying a lot more in rent and maintenance charges and occupancy expenses beyond what you should be. And in some cases, that is a very legitimate concern. We do want to make sure that our rental rates are in line with market rent. But secondly, many of you on a monthly and annual basis will pay something called common area maintenance fees, where you pay your proportionate share of charges incurred by the building in terms of maintenance and operation and general repairs and upkeep. Unfortunately, many of you are not provided with detailed and itemized statements every year, nor do you have the ability to audit those statements to ensure those numbers are accurate. Something that you should know is most dentists, the average practice owner when it comes to maintenance fees, are actually paying more than they should be. And unfortunately, you're not being provided with detailed statements, nor the ability to audit them to ensure that part of your business and that expense that you're incurring are actually fair and reasonable. So we do recommend always to maximize flexibility, minimize risk, and ensure you have fair and affordable financial terms, that we amend the lease to enable you to request these statements as well as the ability to audit them. Now what you'll notice is if your lease agreement has all of the above, your lease will start to function more as an asset as opposed to a liability when you do eventually decide to sell your practice. Now there are really three key components or variables that will factor into the valuation of your business. Now I should mention that we're not practice brokers, however, we are involved in hundreds of practice sales and acquisitions annually. I should also mention that this is really more specific to general dentistry. When you are a specialist, there's a little bit of a different formula or valuation for goodwill. So, you know, keeping in mind that this is really more, more focused on general dentistry. However, as a general dentist, when you are either going through the motions of buying or selling a practice, the first thing that will factor into the valuation is going to be the value of your equipment. In terms of how new or out of date is your equipment, and what is the depreciated value of your equipment today? Now, you will have a practice broker or an accountant uh, appraise the value of your equipment, and that will factor into the valuation itself. For the most part, what will determine value is goodwill. Now, the term goodwill is, is used regularly in dentistry. However, most people don't really know what goodwill is. And to be honest with you, it's a fairly ambiguous term, but when it comes to practice appraisals and and, and practice valuations, goodwill really boils down to one thing, cash flow. How much is the practice producing, how much is it collecting, and how much is it netting? Most practices across the country will end up selling for, on average, somewhere between 60 to 80 percent of one year's gross collections. Now, that being said, when you factor in goodwill and you factor in equipment, the other variable that most people overlook is the lease agreement itself. And the reason the lease agreement factors into valuation is because when you sell your business, number one, if the lease agreement does not have ample term or a number of years remaining on the lease, it may be difficult for the bank to finance the buyer. One very interesting point that all of you should be aware of is 
banks tend to be very lenient with financing dental practice acquisitions because they're very stable, cash-flowing businesses. But what, what banks will generally do is they will structure the term of the loan over the term of the lease agreement. And generally, the banks look for a minimum of five years left on the lease for them to finance the transaction. Meaning, if your lease expires in one year, that doesn't mean you can't sell the business. What that means, though, is when you're in the process of negotiating a deal with a buyer, you as the seller may need to approach the building and try to negotiate terms with them in terms of adding another four or five years while you're going through the motions of selling your business. And what happens in a lot of cases is the landlord finds out that you're going through the process of selling your business. The only way you can sell your business or the buyer can get financing is if the building agrees to add four or five more years. And what happens in a lot of cases is the building will gladly provide you with three or four or five more years of term for your lease, but at a, an exorbitant increase in rent. Because they understand that the only way for you to sell your business for hundreds of thousands or you know, potentially you know, millions of dollars is for them to enable you to stay in that building for another three, four, or five years, and then transfer those interests to a prospective buyer. In other cases, you may have a number of years left on your lease, but you do need the landlord's permission to transfer the lease from you, the seller, to the new doctor taking over. We have dealt with many cases where the landlord leverages control over the transfer of the lease, and they actually ask the seller for a percentage of proceeds from the sale of the business. So with that being said, the lease agreement is essential to the valuation and sale and acquisition process, and unfortunately in some cases, it can actually impact as much as 100% of the valuation of the business. Now, in terms of what's actually in your lease agreement, we're going to spend a few minutes briefly just going through some of the actual terms and conditions in your lease agreement, the first of which being the option to renew clause. Now, this is a clause in your lease agreement that enables you to renew the lease or extend the lease for X number of years when it is coming up for expiry or renewal. Now, generally speaking, a lot of people, will, a lot of doctors for that matter, very rarely will actually read this particular section. The only thing you worry about is how many years do you have left and how many renewal options do you have. Generally, the way the renewal options are worded are very landlord friendly. So what you see before you, 90% of the lease agreements that we review for dentists across the country have very similar and sometimes identical terminology. Now it starts off by saying that provided that Dr. Joe Black shall remain as the tenant, what it's essentially stipulating here is that the option to renew is actually personal to Joe Black. In other words, non-transferable. Now, as I, as I had mentioned earlier, the banks require a number of years on the lease, including renewal options, to finance a buyer. So if the options to renew are non-transferable, in some cases it may actually jeopardize your ability to sell the business. Because again, the renewal options are personal to Joe Black. They are non-transferable. Now, what you may notice is, you may notice that the word tenant at the end of this highlighted sentence is actually red. The reason that the word, or sorry, not red, is capitalized. What you may notice is, it's actually capitalized intentionally. It's not a typo. The reason that the word tenant is capitalized is it is actually a defined term. There is a definition, on, generally on the very first page of your lease, where they define the tenant as you. So many of you, your renewal clause or the option to renew provision is going to stipulate the tenant, capital T, shall have the option to renew this lease for another period of five years. Now you read that and you interpret that to mean, well, I, if I sell my business, they're now the tenant. Unfortunately, if the word tenant is capitalized and on page one of your lease they define tenant as you, it's actually the same thing as it's stipulating providing jo Dr. Joe Black shall remain the tenant. So it's, again, very important that you pay attention to the fine print and understand how to read it and how to interpret the proper terminology in your lease agreement. Now it goes on to say if the tenant has duly and regularly paid its rent and has performed its covenants and obligations under this lease and has not been in default. Now you'll notice the word default is also capitalized. Again, like the word tenant, it's actually a defined term. Now many of you probably know what default is. Essentially, if you do not pay your bills or you're in breach of any of the obligations or, or covenants in the lease agreement, you are considered in default. However, most tenants only understand default to mean one thing. If you don't pay your bills, you are in default. 
there are generally generally the default section in your lease is one page long in terms of the actual definition. It's not just about paying your rent. It's about fulfilling all of your obligations under the lease. So for example, we worked on a case a few months ago in McLean, Virginia, which is pretty much just outside of DC, Washington, D.C. Doctor had been in this particular location for almost 10 years, had signed a 10-year lease with a five-year renewal option. When she went and approached the building about renewing her lease for five more years, they essentially advised her that they would not be renewing her lease, and she had essentially been consistently and habitually in default of her lease. When we contacted the landlord, and you know we were a little confused because she has direct deposit for her rental payment, so she's never been late once. And when we contacted the landlord, they essentially advised us that per the default section of her lease, and she is in a retail strip mall, there are mandatory business hours. Those mandatory business hours being Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, and Saturdays from 8 to 1 p.m. She was closed on Fridays and Saturdays. They were arguing that she's been in default for one purpose. They wanted to charge her more rent. And they had her rent was already pre-negotiated for years 11 to 15. They essentially proposed a 40% increase in rent and we're leveraging this to try to charge her more on a monthly basis. It is important that we understand what it says in the default section of our lease. Now it goes on to say that you have the ability to renew the lease for five more years. You do need to give the landlord nine months notice. It is common, by the way, that you do need to provide advance notice. Um, but it does say that the renewal shall be on the landlord's then current standard form lease. When they say current standard form lease, what they're talking about is that during a renewal, the landlord actually has the right to have you sign an entirely new lease agreement. Obviously not ideal, and generally if they have you do that, it will be on very landlord-friendly terms and conditions. Now it goes on to say that at a minimum rent determined between landlord and tenant, but in no event will your rent be less than the rent paid in the last year of the original term. In other words, regardless of market conditions, regardless of whether the real estate market has crashed, your rent will do one thing, it will go up. We worked on a case recently in South Florida with a general dentist who had been practicing in his space for many, many years, signed a 10-year lease agreement in 2006, again in South Florida. Obviously in 2008 in South Florida, everyone recalls what happened to the real estate market. His lease was coming up for renewal in 2016. The landlord proposed a slight increase in rent. I, I believe, if I remember correctly, they wanted to take him from $31 a square foot per year to $32 per square foot per year. Average rent in his building and in the area was $14 a square foot. Now, why was the landlord able to do that? Because it's stipulated in his lease, as it is for many of you. Regardless of market conditions, your rent is going up. Now, it goes on to say that if you and the landlord do not agree on the rent, you have the right to go through arbitration, however, based on market rent for renewing tenants in the building, meaning it's not the average for the area. It's the average for what other people in the area or other people, sorry, in the building are actually paying. So it's important that we have a properly structured option to renew clause. We want to ensure it's transferable. We want to ensure that it talks about the rental rates during a renewal being based on fair market rent and then having a very explicit definition of what would be considered fair market rent and then some type of cap to make sure your rent doesn't go up exorbitantly from one year to another. Now what you see before you is the assignment and subletting provision. This is the clause in your lease agreement that enables you to transfer your lease agreement in the interest of selling your business, or in some cases, to sublet part of your space. Arguably one of the more relevant and essential parts of your lease agreement, it does talk about essentially, again, your ability to sell the business. Now you'll notice, as for many of you, in order to transfer your lease agreement, you do need the landlord's written permission or consent. Many of you, it will be stipulated that such consent will not be unreasonably withheld. Unfortunately, there will not be any clear definition of what is considered reasonable or unreasonable. Now, something you should know, most landlords do not want to prevent you as a dentist from selling your practice. In fact, frankly, they could probably care less whether or not you sell your business, as their primary goal and mission is to keep their building fully rented and occupied and make sure all of the tenants in their building pay their rent on time. That's their primary goal as, as a building owner. However, most building owners are savvy business people. 
and they will leverage control over the transfer of the lease agreement to charge more rent to the new incoming doctor, which will lower valuation of your business, or in other cases, and more regularly these days, landlords actually leverage control over the transfer of the lease to ask the selling doctor for a percent of proceeds from the sale of the business. We worked on a case uh, in mid-late 2016 in Burlingame, um, just outside of San Francisco, where a general dentist who'd been in her practice for 30-some-odd years, uh, unfortunately, due to health reasons, needed to sell her practice relatively quickly. Um, very successful practice, high-producing office. Um, had a buyer, got in touch with the landlord, and not you know a sophisticated landlord like Kimco and Upland Properties, you know, family-run and operated building. And the landlord essentially told her that the only way they would allow or authorize the transfer of the lease is if she agreed to pay 35% more in rent or they wanted 50%, 50% of proceeds from the sale of her business. Now, it's not every day that we see cases that extreme, but we do see cases regularly that are far less extreme where the landlord's asking for one or two or three or 5% of proceeds from the sale of the business or alternatively, a 10 or 15% increase in rent. So it's essential that the assignment and subletting section be properly structured. Um, for many of you, it will be stipulated that if you simply request permission to transfer your lease agreement, the landlord has the right to terminate your lease or change rental rates. And almost all of you will have it stipulated that even after you have transferred or assigned the lease agreement and the landlord has consented to that transfer, you as the seller or assignor will remain liable as a guarantor for the new doctor who has taken over. So obviously not ideal, and it is essential that we have the assignment section and option to renew among all of the other terms and provisions in your lease properly structured. Now, in the interest of time, we only had the chance to discuss really two sections of your lease. We didn't have an opportunity to discuss relocation clauses or redevelopment clauses. We didn't have a chance to talk about termination rights at length or financial statements. Um, there are a long list of terms and conditions in your lease that you should be aware of and should understand what they say, what they're stipulating, and so on. Now, for those of you who currently are in a lease agreement and, and may have a number of years left on your lease, it's important that you know one of the most important things you'll probably learn this morning. The ideal time to start negotiations is two years before your lease expires or two years before your lease comes up for renewal. From experience, most dentists will start negotiations with their building six months out. The reality is, is you are at a disadvantage in the negotiations because the landlord knows or is aware you likely will not be relocating. Now, the reality is most of you from experience will not move from one location to another due to the cost and time needed to move. However, you need to leverage that in the negotiations in order to you know, negotiate favorable terms and conditions with your landlord. Now, you need to be strategic when you do it. You can't leverage or tell the landlord that, you know, if they don't give you a, a good deal, you will move out because generally that will not end well for you. But if you start the negotiation process two years out, you are putting yourself in a position where the landlord will naturally assume you are contacting them two years before your lease expires because you are considering your options. And when you frame it in such a way, you put yourself in a great position to negotiate better financial and better legal terms. Now, briefly, and I, I'm going to wrap in a minute, and Carrie, I'm sorry that I'm, uh, I'm going a little bit over time here, um, but just very briefly, um, just to walk you through our process. So when we do get involved in negotiations, and again, we represent um, approximately 1,000 doctors a year in these types of negotiations, this is the actual eight-step process that we follow. So we always want to start off by getting a copy of your lease agreement. We will review everything thoroughly. Our team will identify all of the issues, you know, career goals, and, and make sure that our analysis is aligned with the strategy. We will then do research on market rates, comparables, et cetera, to get an idea of how much you currently pay in rent by comparison to going rates in the area. We will then generally regroup on a meeting or a conference call with the client to discuss strategy, outcome, you know, preferred alternatives, and so on. This is really where we start talking about strategy prior to us contacting the landlord. When we eventually do call the landlord, we always start the conversation off with financials in terms of rental rates, 
free rental periods, tenant improvement allowances for you to renovate your office if needed. Um, essentially, the conversations always start off around economics because landlords prefer to talk about money as opposed to legal terms. We generally spend a few weeks, sometimes even a few months, negotiating financials. We then move on to legal. This is where we negotiate you know, removals or limitations on personal guarantees, relocation clauses, redevelopment clauses, options to renew, assignment sections. There's a long list of items that need to get incorporated from a legal standpoint into the negotiations. This generally requires, again, a few weeks, sometimes even a few months. Um, average negotiations are usually about 90 days. It's usually about a three-month-long process from the very beginning to the very end. Um, there's just a lot of paperwork, there's a lot of conversations, and there's quite a bit of back and forth. And after we have negotiated all legal, generally the landlord will prepare a final copy of the lease agreement for signing or execution purposes. We will review it to ensure it's consistent with what's been negotiated. You will then sign it, and essentially the negotiations are concluded. Now, just briefly before we wrap, um, I know many of you uh, may be interested in connecting with us to take a look at your lease agreement. One of the services we provide is a critical date and risk analysis. Essentially, it is a review of your lease agreement. We do normally charge a flat rate of $1,500 for this service. However, for all of you this morning who have decided to join us on the webinar, the lease review service is being offered complimentary. However, it, tonight's, uh, sorry, this morning's uh, webinar uh, has been sponsored by, obviously, Strain and their group, but also um, Henry Schein also sponsored it, and they're subsidizing the cost of the lease review service. So anyone who is interested in it, um, they've only essentially sponsored 15 complimentary lease reviews. Um, obviously, if we need to, we will offer more, but we do ask everyone, if you're interested in the lease review, it's usually about a one-hour-long conference call. We will take a look at your rental rates. We will take a look at how much you're paying by comparison to what you should be paying, our legal team in-house will review the lease agreement entirely to tell you what is good, bad, or ugly, and what needs to be changed. And we will set up a one-hour conference call with you to walk you through everything and essentially help you prepare for the negotiations with your landlord. So if you are interested in the complimentary lease review, my details are here. Um, I'm going to include them in the little Q&A field um, also, so you are welcome to email me. Um, again, it's really reserved for the first 15 people who take advantage of it. You know, if, if there's a few more that need it, by all means. Um, but I do ask you kindly, just email me relatively quickly, or you can, you can call me directly. Um, just let us know that you're interested in the lease review, and uh, one of our associates will contact you to coordinate a time. And I do want to thank you all. Um, if you do have any questions, you can, uh, I will be staying here with Carrie, and you can uh, absolutely put some questions into the Q&A field, or you can email me directly or call me. Um, but I do want to thank you all very much. I hope that uh, it was helpful and enlightening, and uh, I'm going to let Carrie take over and teach you how to better run and manage your practices, and you're, you're definitely in for a treat. Thanks, Justin. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you are loud and clear. Wonderful. And are you bringing up my slides? Uh, I, hold on. I have to make you – give me one second here. You should be able to do it now. And so should I go back to the previous screen? Nope, just click, screen? just click just click next. Click the, uh, the, the down arrow. Ah, okay, hold on one second. Let me sorry about that. I'm just not as technically competent as I should be. No problem. And uh, I think I'm trying to click, but uh, I'm not getting it. Um, I'll, I'll I'll click the next one. But if do you see the little arrow at the bottom left? Ah, uh, hold on. We'll go ahead and get competent on this. Uh, one second, please. Mm -hmm. I do see it. Thank you very much. Well, hi, everybody. What a great presentation, Justin. I mean, I, I just am always impressed by the quality of the uh, advice you, Cirrus and the team gives, you and the team. And uh, no business owner can live without that important advice. Because when you think about the liability exposure people have, if they don't, design the lease right during their operations of their practice, but then passing it on to a, a subsequent owner and having any drag-along responsibilities, it can be quite uh, daunting right. what someone might find in retirement, wouldn't you say? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There's, there's so, too many times that we see lease agreements just you know, completely impacting people's strategies, and they didn't plan for it, unfortunately. 
And, and in my career, folks, you know, I've been, I graduated from college here in Sacramento in 1978. I'm in Sacramento, California today. I actually see someone on the, uh, listening on the webinar who I'm going to be at their office at 730 in the morning, a neighbor of ours, so a client of ours that uh, I've known for many years, and I'm glad that she's on, and we'll get a chance to talk about it. But there I am in the front row. Uh, as you look at it on the right, the gentleman uh, next to me was my father, Harry. My brother was at the top, as we look at it, top left, Larry. He was my partner. I was in public accounting uh, from 78 to 92. I just wanted to be a CPA to be like my dad. Uh, he was a tremendous man. And uh, yesterday being Father's Day, a lot of thoughts about my dad and my brother. My brother was my partner all the way up until when he passed away in 1989. And I, I sold clients and the firm to the gentleman in the middle of the back row, and he's still my CPA to this day. So um, consulting, working with Dennis since 86, I've conducted over 25,000 planning conferences with doctors over the phone. My team and I have probably done about 80% of them. We've worked with over 6,000 different dental practices in the United States and Canada. So I um, have had the opportunity to see a lot of different models that people are exploring and determine whether or not they're really going to get them to, what to, to, to their goals. And that's that's the critical question. There's two big questions when we work with a client, Justin. The number one is how many how many more years do you want to work and how many hours of the week do you want to put in? Right. And number two, when you get to the end of the career timeline, how much money do you need in retirement so you can draw down from it and live the life you want to live for the rest of your life? So these are critical components in determining what your profitability needs to be. And from startup practices to multi-specialty practices to multiple location group practices, to the largest DSOs in the world today, we represent or have represented virtually every size and group practice that there is in the market. And we have clients in 46 states and several provinces to this day. Moving down, um, this is a board here. This is actually there's a transition, I guess, uh, issue and, uh, that we have. And behind it is the agenda. And I, I do want to talk about your KPIs today that you're going to need to have in your practice. I, I want to talk about uh, operating policies and management systems for you to think about. But I also want to talk about what you see in front of you, which is our new strain synchronization process. And just like Cirrus offers you, a, offers you a tremendous opportunity to have your lease reviewed, we offer each one of our uh, interested parties with a snapshot of their practice, um, actually after this call I'm going to one, um, with, with a prospective partner, prospective client who we've downloaded our software onto their software. And if you have Dentrix G5 and more current, and if you have EagleSoft 17 and up and Dentrix Enterprise or Open Dental, uh, which we find to be about 75 to 80% of the practice of software out there, we can do a complimentary snapshot and take a look at your practice to find out exactly how you're leading your practice today, number one, because that's the outcome you're generating. And number two, what opportunities do you have available to you that maybe you haven't considered? So the big four macro influences on dentistry today are the economy and spending, PPOs, tax increases, and corporate dentistry. And the economy, I mean, it's an amazing economy right now, Justin. I'm sure you're seeing lease rates go up in, in some oh, markets. And in some markets, particularly, you know, the California markets where you are, Carrie, it's been, uh, it's been crazy. The well, and unemployment throughout the, throughout the United States is down at around 3.5%, which means right. there's virtually no unemployment. Right. And the pressure that puts on practices is increased overhead because right. supply and demand is an issue. On the, that's on one side. But on the other side, you know, nobody's earning any more money on their retirement funds. Nobody's earn, earning any more money on their investments. And, and if you're a millennial or a Generation Z, you probably don't even care about them yet. You're just living your life and enjoying every moment. But for a lot of the folks, the baby boomers, who the youngest ones were born in, what, 64, so they're 53 this year. So, excuse me, am I doing the right math? I think so, something like that. They've got to be concerned about if, in fact, they do want to retire someday, how much are they going to need to live on? The government only supplies so much. And what we used to talk about, a return on your investment, is now just a return of your investment. Because with the largest borrower in the universe being the United States of America federal government, they don't want to pay any more interest on the amount of monies they've borrowed. Hence, they're not going to allow for the interest rates to grow. So it's something to think about for everybody in dentistry, everybody working. As we look at the migration from, from the population of United States citizens, you can see in the north and out of California all the blue spaces, these are, practice, these, are, these are geographic markets where practices have to work with more focus because there's a lower supply of patients 
then we see the growing markets like Arizona, Texas, Florida, and the Carolinas. Something to be very aware of. Insurance reimbursement reductions, it's, that's a whole other topic. We're seeing no increase in insurance reimbursement, only decreases in insurance reimbursement. And in some states like California, Justin, where I am, if I'm a Delta Premier doctor and I want to sell my practice to you, who you're not a Delta Premier doctor in my market, then you only can enroll as a Delta PPO doctor. And what that means to you is where I might have been producing a million five a year and collecting a million five, the same million five in production in your hands will only yield a million dollars in collections. Hence, it's not that profitable for the buyer. So we're seeing a lot of, a lot of opting out to corporate dentistry, people that are committed to learning and running or know how to run a larger practice because you've got to make it up with fixed cost management. Uh, this change is not going to... It's not going to go. It's not going to reverse. Tax increases. I think uh, President Trump has made it very clear he's going to reduce taxes for the individual. But uh, you know that's a, a, a bit of a, a bait and switch because they need to collect more money. So it's either going to happen through a growing economy, which has got to be global, or they're going to have to tax other uh, uh, areas of ways that they can do it and collect the revenues to fund obligations. So I do see tax increases being a permanent part of our lives, for at least for the rest of my life. Corporate dentistry is growing. Um, I worked with one of these three groups beginning in 1989. They had 33 locations. Uh, we finished up our project, they had 170, and today they have 1,500. So our thinking processes or technology or strategies, uh, intellectual property is all at the foundation of these and many practices. Of, you know, I would say that they, they would say they're committed to doing the right thing. They would say they're committed to building a great culture. And whether they are or not, that's what they're saying in their growing market share. And they're offering perceived lower costs, convenient hours, and they're geared towards that customer base. So you're seeing them grow up in, in every city. I was in Grand Island, Nebraska, Justin, just last Friday, catching a plane out. Right. And I drove right past the Nashville Dental Office. Hmm. So we're seeing a lot of growth in that market. So let's talk about some business of dentistry fundamentals. As your listeners think about ways to increase their bottom line, it's either going to be from increasing their production or collections or decreasing their overhead or both or all three. So we have to think about your vision. Number one, think about a general dental practice, which I would assume most of you are, and think about doing the right thing for patients. I was just on LinkedIn this morning. and Howard Ferran from Dentaltown posted a comment that said a group of dentists had met down in South America and talked about the major issues facing general dentistry today. And it said they can't, the conclusion was the, the, dental popul the dental owners today have lost their way. And it was interesting, Justin, to watch some people respond and say, yeah, they're after the money, or yeah, they're after this, or yeah, they're after that. L let's just focus on standard of care. If a patient of record is someone who's had a comprehensive exam and presented with a comprehensive treatment plan, that, that's a good start. I was just thinking of your wheel of the serious process, Justin, right. and how you walk a client through the eight steps. That was impressive. Your dentist did the same thing in a comprehensive oral evaluation. We do th those same things in starting off with a client. Everybody begins with what is the ideal for their customer. And part of that ideal in general dentistry is to have them in continuing care. Yet it's amazing that from all of the thousands of practice analysis that Henry Schein's done on their, for their customers, that the average percentage of patients who've made it into hygiene in the last year is 48 to 52 percent of the patients seen. So if we're going to do the right thing, let's think about how big is your continuing care department going to be, and let's drive to that. And number two is perfect your treatment planning protocol. And we, we have to start with gathering great records. Imagine Justin's team needing to do an evaluation of your lease and you don't even have a copy of the lease. Well, it's the same thing in dentistry. If we don't have charting of missing teeth, existing restorations, full perio charting, including gentle margins so we can see what the clinical attachment loss is and bleeding on probing, how on earth was it comprehensive? And last, can you imagine saying it was a comprehensive exam without a complete set of films? That's what you need to have gathered in order to conduct the exam and then to be considered a patient of record, present them with a comprehensive treatment plan. Give them a chance to say yes. 
my definition, Justin, of an active patient is a patient has gone through that process and has a scheduled appointment. Over time, in committing to strategy one and two, you can think about who's not making the cut. I was at this practice Thursday in Nebraska, and, and they have a missed appointment policy. Strike one, strike two, not a problem. Strike three, they charge a little bit. That's fine for missed appointment. But afterwards, you miss again, they're going to ask you that you prepay for the entire appointment subject to forfeiture if you fail to keep your appointment. There's some rules you need to apply and know that they're fair. For the people that are committed to, to, that, to you, you can be committed to them. And as you grow strategy one, two, and three, you can finally say, well, maybe I can move out of network with some of these lower reimbursing rates and start building a, an insurance-free practice in steps. It takes time. And it's not necessarily the strategy for all, but it might work for you. Or maybe I skip that and move right on to bringing on an associate. Those are all things to consider. But any way you look at it, here's the profitability formula. And if you're listening to me, that's because in the marketing piece, you wanted to find out ways to increase your bottom line. Now, Justin, you can see this slide, correct? Yeah, I can see that. Okay, most people look at the far right circle and they go, ah, oh, I want to increase profit, right? And then it's like they're reading kanji. They read from right to left, right? They want to say, well, I'm going to reduce my expenses. Well, you know, I've done all that, so what else can I do? Well, I'll increase my insurance collection rate. You don't read this equation right to left. You'll read it left to right. If you're going to have two full-time hygienists, that, those hygienists are going to manage around 12 to 1,400 patients who come to the practice on average three times. There's around 5,000 annual patient visits. Then you've got to look at your treatment planning and the case acceptance success because your annual revenue, or should, I should say your average revenue per patient appointment should be somewhere around $325 to $350, which would put your total revenue up around $1 million, $5 million, six for one doctor and two hygienists. Collection rate? That can vary. Then we can look at expenses. So let's start with annual appointments and revenue before we work on increasing collection rates and trying to whittle down the expenses. The rent, as Justin said, is a very material amount of the expense, and we do want to see it properly negotiated so you don't leak out overhead, and that's what Cirrus does. But in moving the first three buttons, that's what the focus needs to be upon. So again, that formula annual appointments times the average revenue per appointment times your collection percentage minus expenses equals profitability. And I was in Boston at the Yankee Dental Convention earlier this year, and I presented this because they, they'd just been experiencing a dramatic reduction in reimbursement rates up there with Delta. But look at here. Example one, the doctor created a new vision and grew by 20% in terms of visits from 5,000 to 6,000. They led their team through the treatment planning process, through communication strategies, to create engagement with the patient. The doctor was demonstrating positive reinforcement to the assistant and the hygienist, and lo and behold, look what happened. Our revenue per patient visit grew on average from 300 to 400, and our gross revenue grew from 1.5 to 2.4 million. And over time, they weeded out their lower reimbursing plans and reappointed the higher ones, and their collections went from a million two to two million 160. Overhead went up, certainly, but look at the profitability. And if you can increase your profitability by $460,000 and you're already living comfortably at that first level, then the rest of that after tax profitability goes to debt reduction, working capital reserves, expansion of the practice, and ultimately retirement and lifestyle for you and your entire team. So the strategies to increase doctor production, if you want to move forward right now and increase doctor production, you need to be thinking about making it convenient for your patients to schedule a dental appointment. And here's what I'd recommend. Contact all scheduled hygiene patients in the next six weeks. As a matter of fact, our clients are going all the way out to August 19th right now. And they're looking at Justin. He's scheduled on August 1st with, first with my hygienist, Freddie. And when Freddie gets a moment or an administrator gets a moment or my revenue supervisor gets a moment, they're going to call Justin and say, Justin, we're looking forward to seeing you on August 1st for your hygiene appointment with, with Barbara or Freddie, whoever that might be. And by the way, you and the doctor have tried about, talked about that crown and the fillings on the upper right side, and you've got tremendous insurance available. Justin, do you want to kill two birds with one stone so you don't have to drive around to Toronto, Toronto again and come all the way out to the suburbs for your dental appointment? Always. If so, we can help you right now because we've got an hour open beforehand. And think about it. If I was to ask Justin 
this afternoon, if he had an extra hour this afternoon to stay, same day dentistry is an archaic thought process. You might be able to be successful a third of the time, but if you want to increase your success rate from 33% to 90% of the patients saying, thank you for calling me and making it very efficient for my life, I will schedule that appointment, then you're going to be doing what our clients throughout the United States and Canada have done. They're going to be increasing the happiness factor for their patients, making it easy for them to say yes. Ultimately, it's all part of the brand, your brand, the sum of the characteristics of your promise. And last, it's going to increase new patient flow. You can always go, go after the unscheduled patients with pending treatment, but that's the last resort. They just don't have a habit of scheduling. Now, for the hygiene department, you know, I think, doctors, you really need to clarify your soft, tre soft tissue treatment planning philosophy. I mean, charting accurately, I... I Justin, I've looked at thousands of charts, and I can tell you the number of them where the gentle margin documentation, uh, the percentage of them that have it properly, have it documented at all is less than 5%. Hence, the clinical attachment loss can't even be computed. And last, the bleeding on probing, as I saw it recently, uh, just last week, I saw they started charting the bleeding at 5 millimeter when the pocket depths were at 5, because by then it was sudden impact response bleeding. And, you know, every hygienist knows you've got to wait for up to 20 to 25 seconds to go back and look at the area probed and make sure you document it, not only in the period chart, but with the interoral camera. So the next step leads us to reappointing 100% of all our patients, not just our hygiene patients. Every morning in the, do in the daily huddle, the doctor's got to look at their patients and ask, why aren't my patients scheduled for the next continuing care? Let's appointment. Let's sweep them in. In terms of patients with periodontal maintenance, schedule them for their next 90 and 180-day appointment. Concepts of offering fluoride, sealants, all these things are part of creating your continuing care policy because every practice does have a maximum number of patients they can manage, and it's, it's just calculated very simply by determining the patient capacity of your hygiene department. So, again, this slide talks about if patients are not in continuing care, they're out of care. And there's my clear example of a pocket debt being properly measured, but no gingival margin documentation, hence the clinical attachment loss is not computed correctly, and there's no bleeding listed on probing. It's no wonder this patient doesn't know any different and why we spin it out to a profi palace, no perio. So think about where you want your practice to stand up. One doctor, one hygienist, one doctor, two, one doctor, three. I'm, I'm a very conservative business owner, Justin. I, I, I'm risk adverse, right. and I know the more customers I have, the, the safer my economic model is going to be. So if I was a dentist, I'd have three hygienists, and we could show people how to properly manage it in states where that's appropriate. A two hygienist model is going to get the doctor to about a million four to a million six a year today. May not collect it all, but that's going to be where the production is. You get to that model from where you are. You have more patients you can manage. Let's bring on another doctor. Let's bring on another hygienist. Let's expand our facility. And even when you expand your facility, and for many people, Justin, they own their practice. They own a practice, yet they don't have a lease agreement between their practice and themselves, and the associates buy in, and, you know, without any clear definition, we've got conflict, right, Justin? When, in fact, that owner should have a, a, a lease agreement between themselves and their practice so others can buy into the practice and assume that obligation as well. Do you ever see that right. as a problem? Oh, for sure. So Cirrus can help you with that, to know that it's set up properly and that all parties are going to find it to be satisfactory. Right. So ultimately, what limits our production? Do we not have enough patients? I doubt it. You know, in working with over 6,000 patients, it's been in fewer than 20 times that I've had to say to the practice owner, you need to hire a marketing firm to expand your patient base because they're already there. We, we just don't have a system to lead us to grow our hygienists or our treatment rooms or our dentists because we haven't updated our vision, our policies, our management, and maybe personally we aren't comfortable sharing with that, influencing others with our leadership, and, and by default our plan isn't defined and it's not realized. But with the right management systems, we can lead our team to guide our patients through the protocol of patient flow. Patients come in for an appointment. There's got to be an exam. What happens? Treatment planning. What are the top three things that happen? Financial arrangements. What are the top three things that should happen? How do we schedule it? Confirm it. Deliver treatment. Collect the money. Reappoint the patient. And last, bill and collect the insurance. We need to find who does what, index it into your operating policies, put that in the job descriptions, and begin an education protocol so your team can be led to take our written policies on the left that are customized for your practice. The first four are clinical in nature 
then financial and scheduling and confirmation, late patient missed appointment. So the team can know what to do, you can lead them, and as they do it, you can shape their performance with positive reinforcement. The benchmarks every practice owner's got to set. You might want to hit print screen right now because this says, I need to know how many patients I'm going to have scheduled in continuing care by the end of next summer. How many new adults do I need a month? How many reactivation calls and people reactivated will there be per week? My case acceptance percentages. My case acceptance per month in the dollar amount has got to be greater than my doctor's goal. My AR to production ratio has got to be aligned. My adjustments, what I'm willing to participate in plans causing me to reduce my collection rate. What are my doctor's goals and my missed appointment goals? If we don't know what these are, Justin, then we can't forecast the economic right. consequence of committing to this vision. Right. And hence, this guy's going to get to the point where he's going to go, where did I go wrong? Well, it all, it all begins at the beginning. And today is amnesty day. Today is your beginning. And if we cast the right vision, if we have the right policies, and we lead our team with purpose, clarity, and focus, we're going to achieve our goals. We work with practices of all size all over the country. And there's, I like this, uh, this line we have up top. You know, strain eats data for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And years ago, I committed to learning all about syncing with data and software. And for all of your customers who are on this phone and your guests that are on this phone, we want to sync with your data. Step one, arrange a sync. And I'm going to tell you how to do that in just a minute. We're going to look at your data and have a one-hour conference call between you and one of my certified strain consultants. There's nine of them. I've trained them. I've worked with most of them for longer than six, seven years. They are the leaders in the industry knowing what we know to be the critical information to give us feedback on the past, but also what you'll see with the strain sync program is what's coming up in the future. And we want to walk you through a live demonstration. And Justin, not just on a practice's data, but on your data. And right. when your names are there and your patient's names are there, it's going to explode your thought process. So contact Stephanie Gonzalez to schedule a complimentary strain sync today. Write this number down, 800. 568-7200, Steph can be reached directly at 916-836-3406 or email her and say, Stephanie was on the phone call with Justin and Carrie today. I have G5, G6, EagleSoft 17, 18, Dentrix Enterprise or Open Dental. Arrange a sync. I want to see what you folks see so I can clearly cast a vision for my future, and we'd be happy to do that. Also get connected to Strain on our social media, and I'm very proud to be a part of this great team, and I'm very grateful for our partners at Cirrus that I could be on the phone with my friend Justin today. Justin? Yeah, I want to thank you, Kerry. That was great. And honestly, every time you know we, we have these webinars and these speaking engagements, and every time I get to join you on a call, it's remarkable how much you learn. And uh, you know, there's, there's so many different moving parts of the practice, and you know, frankly, people need help, and it's important that people know when to ask for help. So. Um, Carrie, do you want to thank you very, very much, and doctors want to thank all of you for taking some time out of your mornings or afternoons to join Carrie and I. Um, I would encourage everyone to take advantage. Uh, if you have any questions, you can reach out to Carrie, you can reach out to myself, um, you can reach out to Stephanie. Um, we are here to help you. We are here to support you and help you grow and manage your businesses. Um, my contact details are there, are, uh, as are Stephanie's. Um, if you are interested in the consultations, please just email myself or Stephanie and you can let us know and uh, we'll coordinate calls. And uh, again, want to thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure. And uh, Carrie, want to thank you again. And thank you. Uh, doctors, be well. We do hope to uh, speak to you all soon. Take good care.